All right, welcome. Today we're tackling something that's on every clinician's radar, levothyroxine. Specifically, we're going to walk through the brand new 2025 ETA guidelines. Now we all know LT4 is a cornerstone of our practice for hypothyroidism, but let's be honest, getting that dose just right can be a real headache. These new guidelines, they're packed with practical advice to help us fine tune things for our patients. So let's just start with this number because it really sets the stage, about 50%. Levothyroxine is what, one of the most prescribed drugs on the planet? And yet almost half of our patients taking it aren't actually in their target therapeutic range. They're either underdosed or overdosed. That's a massive disconnect, right? And that leads us to the big question we're gonna explore. How can one of our most common bread and butter therapies be missing the mark so often? It's not just one thing, of course. It's this whole tangle of issues. The patient, the dose, even the specific pill they're taking. So let's dig into what the ETA guidelines say and pull out some real practical solutions you can put to use right away. Okay, so first things first, let's talk about the patient themselves. Because before we jump to complex stuff like malabsorption or drug interactions, the guidelines really urge us to start with the basics, adherence and timing. These are absolutely foundational for getting stable TSH levels. And this is where the guidelines get really useful. They give us a clear numerical trigger, a red flag. If you find you're pushing a patient's dose past about 1.7 micrograms per kilogram per day, or a bit higher, around 2.0 for someone who's had a thyroidectomy, you need to pause. Your first thought shouldn't be more dose. It should be, is the patient actually taking it? The guidelines have a term for this, pseudomalabsorption. So let's be really clear on this distinction. Pseudomalabsorption is just a clinical term for non-adherence. It looks like the gut isn't absorbing the drug, but it's really a behavioral issue. True malabsorption, on the other hand, is a real physiological problem. Something like celiac disease or gastritis is physically blocking absorption. And figuring out which one you're dealing with, well, that changes everything about your next step. So how do you tell the difference? This is your go-to diagnostic tool, the levothyroxine absorption test. It's pretty straightforward. You bring the patient in, they're fasting, you give them a single large test dose, say 600 micrograms. Then you just track their free T4. And here's the key. If you see that FT4 jump by more than about 5.15 picomoles per liter after three hours, you've got your answer. Their gut works fine. The problem is almost certainly adherence. Now, another huge patient factor is just, when are they taking the pill? The new guidelines are all about consistency and separation. The ideal is either a full hour before breakfast or at bedtime, you know, at least three hours after dinner. But what's most critical? Whatever schedule you and the patient decide on, they have to stick with it every single day. Consistency is king here. Okay, so let's say your patient is perfectly adherent, their timing is impeccable, but their TSH is still all over the place. What's next? Well, now we have to look at all the other things going into their system. We're talking about the minefield of food and drug interactions that can mess with LT4 absorption. And this is where we have to become detectives in the exam room. You've got to ask about the simple stuff. That morning cup of coffee? It needs to be at least an hour after they take their pill. Milk in their cereal? High fiber foods? These things literally bind to the drug and prevent it from being absorbed. You need to counsel them on separating these by several hours. And then there are the drugs. This list can be long, but let's focus on the big ones we see all the time. PPIs, huge culprit. They change the stomach's pH, which is critical for tablet absorption. You need a four hour gap, minimum. Same goes for those over-the-counter calcium and iron supplements. They're notorious for grabbing onto levothyroxine and stopping it from ever getting into the bloodstream. So here's the bottom line, and it's a direct recommendation from the task force. If a patient who was stable suddenly isn't, you absolutely have to do a deep dive on their medication history before you touch their dose. And I mean everything, prescriptions, vitamins, supplements, the whole nine yards. Don't just ask what's new, ask what are you taking, period. All right, shifting gears a bit. The guidelines also carve out some really important advice for special populations. These are cases where the standard rules don't always apply and we need to tweak our approach. Okay, let's run through these quickly because they're all clinically vital. For pregnancy, you're monitoring TSH, free T4, and total T4 at least once a trimester. Things change fast. 
For fertility, you want to be proactive. Think about bumping up the LT4 dose before ovarian stimulation to keep that TSH under 2.5. With central hypothyroidism, forget TSH. It's useless here. You're tracking free T4 only. With obesity, dosing is nuanced. Think about lean body mass, not just total weight. And for our elderly patients over 70, we relax the TSH target. We really want to protect their heart and bones from iatrogenic hyperthyroidism. So we've talked a lot about problems, adherence, food, drugs, all these things that mess with gut absorption. This naturally leads us to a really interesting part of the new guidelines, a potential solution. We're talking about looking beyond the standard tablet. Here's the fundamental difference. A standard tablet has to be broken down in the stomach first. That whole process depends on having the right amount of stomach acid. But the liquid in soft gel versions, the level thyroxine is already dissolved. It completely bypasses that whole pH-dependent step, which, as you can imagine, is a huge advantage in certain patients. So these non-tablet forms are essentially levothyroxine pre-dissolved in glycerol and water. The mechanism is simple. They skip the whole tablet disintegration phase. And the key feature, the reason we're talking about this, is that their absorption is no longer tied to stomach acid levels. For anyone on a PPI or with atrophic gastritis, this is a potential game changer. And this, for me, is one of the biggest takeaways from the entire guideline. This is a real shift in thinking. The recommendation is to consider liquid or soft gel LT4 as a first-line option in patients who are at risk for malabsorption. We're not waiting for the tablet to fail anymore. We're being proactive. So who should be on your radar for this? The guidelines spell it out pretty clearly. You've got your patients with gastric issues. Think atrophic gastritis, H. pylori, or anyone on long-term PPIs. You have your post-bariatric surgery patients. Anyone on a feeding tube, obviously. And it's also a great option for infants and small children just for ease of administration. Okay, that was a lot of information. So let's boil it all down. What are the key actionable takeaways from these 2025 guidelines that you can bring to your practice? Really, it comes down to this. First, we need to truly individualize therapy. Look at weight, age, and what else is going on with the patient. Second, and this is crucial, we have to investigate before we escalate. Always check for adherence and interference issues before you just up the dose. And finally, we need to actively select the right tool for the job. Think about which formulation, tablet, liquid, or soft gel, is truly the best fit for that individual patient sitting in front of you. And that really leaves us with a final, forward-thinking question. For years, our focus has been on personalizing the dose of levothyroxine, but these guidelines are pushing us to ask, Shouldn't we be personalizing the formulation right from the start, not just as a backup plan, but as our first-line choice? It's definitely something to think about. Thanks for joining me.